Hey everybody, Rich Brancacci again. Wanted to welcome folks who are joining additionally. Uh, we'll just give a couple more minutes to folks who are coming online. But we're excited to have you today. We are going to be doing a question and answer session afterwards. Uh, so please let us know if you have any thoughts, questions, recommendations, suggestions, et cetera. We love, love taking your calls. We'll get started in just a moment. People are coming in by the moment. All right, well, it is 1 p.m. So we will get started and we will share any refreshers with folks who are just signing in late momentarily. But thanks for joining us today. My name is Rich Brancaccio. I'm the founder and CEO here at Revive Technologies. I'm also a former school psychologist. Uh, it was something I did for about 10 years and I absolutely loved it. I had so much fun um, conducting assessments with children, coming up with intervention strategies, working with their parents and their teachers uh, with the IEP teams. Um, and I left the full-time uh, practice of school psychology. I, I left uh, completely actually about four years ago. So I've been at Revive here for four years full-time. The company has been around longer than that, but I couldn't, couldn't, uh, keep two jobs at once, uh, if you will, for, for that long. So I left about four years ago and um, we're bringing technology to kids uh, on their wrists now. So we're on our second version um, of Revive. So it's been a great journey for us, um, gotten funding from the U.S. Department of Education, which has been really exciting for us. And we work with some of the largest companies and some of the biggest names um, in, in the attention and focus space right now. So Without further ado, um, we've got some more people that have just joined us. Uh, welcome, everybody. We will get the party started. So let me go ahead and share my screen. We have a presentation for you to walk you through what we're going to be working on today. All right, hopefully you guys can see my screen and we will get started with our presentation. So we're talking today about 12 different ways that you can help your child with ADHD to potentially improve their focus without necessarily um, using medication as your only option. So some of the things I wanted to talk about today were some strategies, some things you can look into, some things you can talk with your pediatrician about, your psychologist, your school psychologist. Um, and we just wanted to be a, a liaison, if you will, to, to share some potential information with you that maybe you haven't had access to before. So we're here to enlighten you, we're here to inform you, and we're here to educate you um, because knowledge is really the key to helping your child to do better, uh, whether it's with their grades or whether it's with focus or whether it's behavior, uh, whatever it may be, uh, whatever way that they're challenged by their ADHD, and everyone's very different. Uh, we want to be a group who can bring to you some different ideas and thoughts to enlighten you about how you can go about getting the process started. So as I mentioned to you guys who have been here for a couple minutes, my name is Rich Brancaccio. I'm the founder and CEO here at Revive Technologies. I'm also a former school psychologist. Uh, I did work in the classroom at one point. Um, I've worked as a special education teaching assistant uh, during my graduate school years. Uh, I've worked as an in-home autism therapist and worked as a school psychologist uh, for, for many years. So we're here today, again, to share some information with you guys. A quick disclaimer for what we're trying to do and to be responsible with the way we're doing it. Um, we want you to talk to your, your child's doctor if you have questions about these kinds of things. Uh, we're not doctors. We don't pro provide medical advice. Uh, nothing should be construed here today to be considered medical advice, and we're not saying that any of the interventions we're gonna share are cures for anything related to ADHD or other conditions. Uh, but if you have questions about your medications, about interventions, et cetera, please be sure to speak to your child's pediatrician. Um, so let's move on with the presentation today. Some interesting facts, uh, about 77% of kids with ADHD receive treatment. Um, another interesting fact, uh, only about half of those kids actually take their meds consistently. Um, now, of that group of 77% who've been prescribed meds, 30%, um, or, or sorry, of the 77% of the who are receiving some kind of treatment, 30% uh, are treated with medication alone. 
Okay, and, and only about, again, half of those kids who are taking medications in general actually consistently take their meds. Um, so about 30% are treated with meds by themselves, 15% receive behavioral treatment alone, uh, and 32% receive medication and behavioral treatment. Um, general rule of thumb for anything in psychology and the psychology umbrella is um, the, the wisest approach to solving a problem that pertains to psychology is to use a multimodal solution. Um, so it sounds like some of those folks are certainly taking that approach. Um, there's usually not one size fits all. There's no um, silver bullet, if you will. There's no magic cure or, or remedy for any one particular thing in most cases. So in a lot of cases in life, um, you know, your best case scenarios typically happen when you are able to take a multimodal approach, which means you're, you're look, looking at um, f potential pharmacological intervention, you're looking at potential behavioral intervention, you're, you're looking at a couple different things, diet, exercise, it's just a good idea to, to understand and explore all your different options and to speak to your pediatrician about your different options. So meds don't always work for everyone. Um, I have seen some amazing stories um, with meds when I worked as a school psychologist. I've seen some not so pleasant stories um, unfold in front of me. Um, but again, every child is very different and their response can be very different. So speak to your physician about, um, you know, what those outcomes may look like potentially for your child. Uh, there are some side effects sometimes. I um, just wanted to talk about some of those. You will sometimes see irritability, sometimes see insomnia, decreased appetite, um, delayed growth. Um, but if medication helps, additional interventions could make things even better on top of that. So that's where we were talking about multimodal approach before. Um, so again, this is the, the, the goal here is to talk about some other things, but we wanted to start out by just sharing with you kind of some, some background information, things you should just generally know when you're um, a parent or a guardian and you're making decisions about your child's um, health and well-being. So we want you to be educated, go into that pediatrician's office and ask those good questions that you deserve to know. So. To segue on, what else can you do to help your ADHD child focus? Uh, we talk about this a lot and we try to do our weekly webinars um, on topics that are relevant to you, our, our viewing audience. Um, so if you have any suggestions for us at the end, please let us know. Um, we're here to support you guys. We're here to give you guys good information and, and share um, some knowledge, uh, however best we can impart it upon you. So the first thing we like to talk about is stick to a routine. Um, kids typically who struggle with focus, particularly those with ADHD, really benefit from a routine. Um, you'll see things like, you know, schools, when you look at a school, an in-school situation versus you look at a school from home or a remote learning situation, as we're experiencing during COVID-19, um, a lot of kids with ADHD have had a really hard time transitioning to do the school from home thing. And their parents, most of you guys, are likely feeling the effects or have felt the effects and are still potentially struggling to come up with a good plan. Um, but the more consistent you can make things, um, the better that they will go. Uh, a consistent schedule, as our slide here says, creates clear expectations for your child that is easier to replicate without getting distracted. Um, what happens typically is in school, things are very regimented, they're very segmented, they're very clean. Uh, oftentimes there's a bell that will ring throughout the whole school to signify that there's a period change or a class change, um, you know, when it's lunchtime. So these things are consistent. And although school may feel very um, easygoing and you may have a really cool, friendly teacher who's pretty lax um, or pretty flexible and fluid, that teacher um, in 99% of cases typically is following a pretty strict routine um, each day. So when you, the parent, are trying to enforce these rules at home, you can get into some big challenges because um, kids are used to, and their bodies are used to using your home as a place to relax and have fun, create family memories. It's not used to doing a ton of work in this unique setting, which is home. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. But primarily, the, the thing to remember is create a routine and stick to it. As you start to put a routine in place and then you backpedal, it's really, really challenging. You're undoing everything you've done before. So be sure to stick to it, set realistic goals. You can start out, even if it's, we're gonna do work for 15 minutes and we're gonna do it consistently. Um, make sure that you do not back down off of that. Um, you'll be tempted as things get better or as your child is learning the routines to maybe flex a little bit. Um, but it's, again, it's important. Your child's teacher doesn't say, you know what? We're just not gonna do math today, everyone. We're just gonna do more science because we're having fun. 
It's not how it goes. So just try to think like a teacher when you're at home. And even for you teachers out there, a lot of you parents are teachers. Um, it's really hard to, to tr take your teaching brain and bring it home. Um, it's kind of like worlds collide, but try to just remember, what would I do if I were in school right now? How would I operate? Um, take the same mentality at, at home. So what we have for you guys um, is just a free tool that, that you can use. Um, couple of free tidbits of information. So there's some free resources. If you go to our website, uh, it's about a four or five minute read. It's on our blog. Um, it's free educational resources for students at home during COVID-19. We have a couple of great links to free websites um, that are offering free um, educational services, if you will, um, online educational platforms, um, who we've had a lot of good feedback from our users, from you guys who have shared, hey, those are some great links. I really like them and I use them. So definitely check those out if you haven't already. Um, we also have um, a printable um, bedtime routine that you can print out, um, which is terrific, uh, along with some other really neat things that we'll talk about. Um, so designate a school workspace. This is important. Um, if you've had a place where you, if your child's done good work, traditionally doing homework, I suggest looking at that space again. It can be harder when you're trying to teach them in their bedroom, um, but what often happens is um, if you're using the kitchen or someplace like that, which could be a great space, depending upon how your house is set up, how many children you have, if other adults or um, children are working from home, basically you wanna create a quiet private space that's gonna have minimal distractions um, that, that you can consistently you know, teach this child in. Um, kids are notorious for anything that's there. If there's some hand sanitizer or some chewing gum or pens and pencils, whatever may be on the table, um, they're notorious to pick it up and play with it. Now, fidgeting is not bad for every child. And actually, we're seeing from our research and our database, um, when we look at aggregated numbers and we look at de-identified um, data from our users, we're seeing that fidgeting is actually very helpful for a lot of these children. Um, so don't necessarily snatch something away and say, no, 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 you're not going to fidget with that. You're not going to use this pen here and, and shake it in the air or anything like that. Because what you'll see sometimes is fidgeting seems to be a coping mechanism. Um, from what we've seen, and allowing children to have something that's non-distracting to others and that's non-negative, um, non if you will, for them. So it's not precluding them from doing their work if they're, you know, listening to you teach and they're shaking their pen like this, uh, or they're shaking their foot up and down. Um, it could actually help them out a lot. So consider that Again, fidgeting is not necessarily bad. It's when you get something where the child starts to play with something and they're building something and they're completely not focused on what they should be working on. That's where it becomes a challenge. So the ideal workspace for kids, eliminate distractions, get away from busy areas. Make sure the TV is off in most cases. The phone should be out of reach. Um, you can, uh, again, this is where the TV off thing comes from, where I said in most cases, because everyone's different. If you're playing the classical music TV station or something like that, um, that may be helpful for kids. So listening to music, if it helps. There's been a lot of studies showing classical music can help focus. Um, as an adult uh, who believes that they have ADHD, I feel like um, for me, my brain sometimes just seeks more input. It wants information, even when I'm working focused well on something. Um, so for me, I do like to have some background music on because it kind of fills uh, you know, all the cognitive voids that my brain's looking to get some kind of stimulation while I'm doing work. So that's where the music comes in. So um, my, my brother um, struggled to focus in school and he used to listen to his own music. He would listen to like Blink-182, I remember when we were in school. Um, and my mom, who's a teacher, um, since retired, would let him listen to this music. And, and we all thought it was strange he could listen to this rock music, but for him, it actually worked really, really well. So you have to take it on a case-by-case -case situation. Um, and you may be surprised to see what actually works for your child. So, you know, be willing to experiment within reason, you know, be flexible, um, but you have a good starting place. Classical music is pretty good for, for most kids. Um, use colors. Um, you, can, you can break things apart, potentially when it comes to organization. Um, there's different moods that are associated with different colors. For example, orange is kind of a comforting and uplifting color. Um, blue is kind of a, a good focus color, if you will. Green's relaxing. Um, so color coding things can really help when it comes to organization because a lot of these children tend to struggle with what we call executive functioning. And just like the name implies, executive functioning is what an executive may do in a company. Um, you have to be mindful of everything that's going on. Keep a lot of things on your cognitive plate, if you will. So what do I have to do today, this hour, this, this week, this month? 
Um, who do I have to reach out to to make this happen? What things do I have to start doing today to get it done by the end of the week? Um, these children typically have a hard time with this. Um, so it's, it's a good thing um, to get them organized so that it's one less thing for them to have to face in terms of challenges. Chunking is a great strategy. This is when you break really large tasks or even moderately large tasks down into smaller, less intimidating items that can be tackled one at a time. A good example is this. If you tell your child in the morning, tomorrow when you wake up, I want you to wake up, change out of your pajamas, brush your teeth, you're gonna comb your hair, get your homework, put it in your backpack, and then come down for breakfast. Most kids will probably remember to do two of those things, maybe. There's a reason that our telephone numbers are generally seven digits. The human brain is not amazing at remembering long, long strings of things that are contiguous, if you will. Um, so that's why even our phone numbers are broken down uh, into chunks of three. So 919-521-8444. Um, do the same thing. Think of the telephone number system when you're telling your child things. So instead of do these five things and come and see me, you're going to wind up going to their room and saying, you have only done one or two things. What happened? When in reality, it's not their fault because they couldn't remember what you said beyond the second or third item. So wake up, brush your teeth, change out of your PJs, come find me. Then I'll give you two more things. Come find me. Same thing goes for homework. Um, instead of giving a child with ADHD uh, a big page that has 25 math problems on it, say, do these 25 problems and call me when you're done. There's a phenomenon that occurs in children with ADHD where, um, and, and adults as well, I believe, um, where we over and underestimate things. So what that means is uh, we'll typically underestimate how long it will take us to do something that we view to be simple or easy. Um, you know, Rich, what time will you be um, at this meeting across town? Well, it's about 10 miles away. It's about a mile a minute. Um, I'll be there by 10 minutes. Mm -mm. Not taking into account traffic, not taking into account stopping and gas and getting in the car, getting out of the car, walking in the elevator. So there's all these things that come into play to underestimate time, but the same goes for overestimating. I'm sure those of you sitting in the audience today have experienced when you go to tell your child to do something that's perceived as either difficult, challenging, or not very fun, you'll get this, oh, no, it's going to be impossible. It's going to take forever. I can't do that. It's such a, a, a hard thing to do. They'll dramatically overestimate or overreact to the challenge of something. Now, we all know homework can take some of these children two, three, four hours, and it becomes a knock them down, drag them out, feeling battle uh, of attrition when you're doing homework. But we also know that if we're giving a child 15 math problems that we know should only take them a couple minutes, let's say it's two plus two, four plus four, really simple stuff, the reaction will oftentimes be the same. Oh my gosh, I can't do this, it's such a big deal. So instead of doing that, just say, hey, we're gonna do a couple math problems, we're gonna do three at a time. Do three, stop, call me, or do three, stop, slide this piece of paper down and look at it only in chunks of three with this piece of paper that'll block the other problems or do them in fives if it's in rows of five. This will really help kids to focus on what's going on and to not take themselves out of the fight, if you will, before it even starts. So here's some more examples of chunking. Instead of do your homework, let's finish these three math problems before dinner. Instead of one 30 to 40 minute homework session, let's try three or four 10 minute sessions. This goes into taking breaks, which we'll talk about later, but breaks are important. So we have a printable planner. It's free. It's available on our website. We made it just for you guys. We actually partnered with some friends of ours uh, over at fastbrain.com. Um, they're a great resource uh, for strategies and things like that for focus and attention. Um, but you can download this, and it's really good because it helps you, the parent, get a schedule in place that you can consistently follow. And it's really important for the child too, because it allows them to see exactly what they have coming up now, what's coming up next, and to appreciate the work that they've done. Um, they can also daily journal things that they've done well today. It builds up some self-esteem. Can also rate themselves as a personal score to say, this is just for me. I think I did a pretty good job today. I'm proud of myself. We'll talk about this more later in terms of praising children, because that's important too. So take some breaks. It might sound counterintuitive, but it's gonna help your child maintain focus. The example I give everybody is uh, when you have your cell phone and it is winding down on the battery and you know you have 2% left, you should get off the phone or tell your friend to hold on a second and let me run to the charger and plug it in. 
but when you wait just a minute too long and it dips below that critical threshold, your phone shuts off. In the same way, in my pr perspective, children's focus can also shut off if you go too far. Um, then when you go to plug it back in, you plug your phone back in, you say, hey, uh, charge, let's get back to work, phone. Mm -mm. You get that annoying battery icon that says, we're going to make you wait five or 10 minutes before we'll power up. Next time you should have taken a break sooner and plug me in. Children's brains, uh, again, in my opinion, get driven uh, or, or you know, wound down in terms of their level of focus. It's like an hourglass. It runs down. And you have to stop and flip it back over. How do you flip it back over? You don't physically flip your child over. What you do is you give them a break. The break has been shown to improve focus. Um, and instead of trying to work, uh, your phone starts to get real wonky when the, the battery gets low. Things start to load slowly. Applications start to get weird. Um, video, if you're streaming FaceTime, will start to get real chunky and, and blocky. The same goes for focus. So instead of having your child try to power through 40 minutes straight of doing their work, when in reality, the last 20 minutes of that chunk has been spent working at like 2% or 5% of their, their cognitive capacity, if you will, or their focusing ability, um, take a break, get that battery charged back up, and then bring them back. Um, it sounds like it'll take longer, but it really doesn't. If you're driving to a gas station because your gas is low and you're driving really slowly because you don't want to run out of gas, um, instead of taking your whole trip in this low gas mode, you're creeping along, you just pull over, take a break, fill up. You can drive you know, faster, more appropriately between stops. Same thing for your child's focus and attention. So here's some ideas. Have them play with a toy. I love Legos. I think it's a really good creative problem solving type of toy. Um, it's something they can get into, um, pause and kind of come back to you without getting too upset or, or without taking themselves uh, away from either task. Have a quick snack. Water break is always a good idea. Go outside, play with the pet, dance to a favorite song. Um, it's good to have things that are um, time-based, uh, particularly, hey, you can go dance to two songs because you know two songs are going to be about five, six minutes. Um, so general rule of thumb, have the kids work for 15 minutes, 20 minutes tops, and then take a five-minute break. Um, and just be consistent. A parent asked us last week for our webinar, um, how do I get them back off the break? There's different tools that are out there. Our device has a homework mode that helps your mind, but you can use any device. Um, you can use an egg timer. You can use your phone. You know, if you have an iPhone or an Android, you can use your timer function to say, when this thing beeps, you need to come back. Exercise. This is a great um, outlet, both during break time. Hey, go out and do some quick exercise. Also, just a good general idea to build in, particularly, excuse me, when you're doing a school from home or a remote learning situation. Um, building exercise in there is good for the kids. It's also good for you, the parents who are at home, um, particularly those who are working from home. It's good to get out, take a little bit of a break, get moving. It's, it's never, never a bad idea. Benefits of exercise for kids with ADHD. Um, you know, we've heard people talk about decreases in stress hormones, that it encourages brain cell growth in the hippocampus, which is an area of the brain responsible for your memory and learning. Um, physical activity is a good, healthy coping mechanism for busy minds. Um, again, I think it goes back to some of the fidgeting. We see kids who are moving, they're shaking their legs back and forth, their feet under the table like this. Um, you know, you can use something like a bouncy band to help encourage good fidgeting if you feel that it's helpful. Um, and we're, we're good buddies with the crew over at Bouncy Bands. We, we really like what they put out as well. So check that out if you've never seen a bouncy band before. It's a really good tool that goes under uh, your chair legs just to help kids move a little bit. Um, so in terms of nutrition, this is a good item to keep in mind. And again, talk to your child's physician, a pediatrician, um, about what a good balanced nutrition looks like. But generally speaking, um, it's a great conversation to have because there are different things that are helpful and probably unhelpful um, for kids' bodies at this age who are facing focus challenges. Here's some general tips. Make sure you're eating breakfast. Not rocket science, it's been around forever. Uh, but a lot of people do wind up skipping breakfast or they'll just whip up something um, you know, that's less than optimal for their child. Um, we've seen some studies that do show some positive effects on math and arithmetic solving when kids are properly um, you know, fed in the mornings. Um, try to get rid of artificial colors and preservatives. Uh, I'm of the mindset myself that you, know, um, you should always try to go towards organic if, if possible. You know, if you're able to get organic foods, um, it's always a good idea to, to get rid of things like preservatives, uh, pesticides, things like that that you don't really want in your food. Um, 
we have seen some things and heard some people talk about increasing hyperactivity with different things. Um, so again, speak to your pediatrician and learn more about that. Um, reducing sugar, also not a bad idea. Um, you know, you literally are what you eat. So keep that in mind as you're giving your children their food. Better overall health can potentially equal better overall focus. Setting goals, this is important. Uh, you can see here, dream big, set goals, and take action. So when a goal is met, celebrate together to boost confidence. Use rewards to further incentivize task completion. Collaborate with teachers and staff. Um, this is important, and it also goes back to the previous slide, which I'll back up to in terms of setting goals. These children, I've worked with a lot of them. I used to test about 100, 120 children a year when I worked as a school psychologist, um, which is a large caseload for, for any school psych. Um, what I would consistently see among kids with ADHD is that they are typically just as intelligent or, or more uh, than the average child. So they would tell me, and it would break my heart, I can't do it. I'm not as smart as the other kids. The other kids are smarter than me, or I'm dumb. It would break my heart because I would know from the cognitive assessment I just gave them that their full-scale IQ was average to above average, which means that they're just as capable or more capable uh, than their typically developed peers, you know, than, than the average child in their classroom. Um, but what's interesting about these kids, they'll sometimes get either, they'll give themselves in their mind a bad rap. I can't do it, I'm always getting in trouble. Or they'll get a bad rap from any of us, the teachers, parents, whomever it may be, because when you have something that's consistently there, so if you have one child in the class or one of your own children who typically gets in trouble, your gut reaction when you hear something break and someone's crying across the house is to go, oh, it's that one child that I have who's always getting in trouble and you yell their name out, what did you do now? Or you ask the other sibling, what did he or she do now? Um, it's, a tough, it's a tough act for that child to be a part of, when, when, especially when they're the ones uh, who didn't engage in that behavior, but they're getting blamed for it. So it's really important to set goals and to celebrate together. What I want to make clear is these kids typically want to do well. Um, I've met very, very few kids, and I've worked from preschool up to kids who are 21 years old in high school um, throughout my career. Uh, and I've met very, very few children and young adults who truly do not want to do well. Um, they will tell you sometimes, I don't care. I don't care about school. This is stupid. I don't care what you think. I hope I fail. I'm going to drop out. I don't care. It's a protective mechanism. You know, it's a, it's a self-defense mechanism. They're protecting themselves. I've had children who have told me, I would rather not try than, I than try and fail. Failure is really tough for people, especially these kids who have dealt with it for so much. So I've had a lot of kids tell me, the reason I don't try in school is because if I don't try, I have nothing to lose. But if I do try my best and I come up short, that feels really bad. It feels worse than not trying at all. So it's important to give these kids something to start with. Give them a victory. Give them some little successes. Once they get a taste of success, you'll see they're hungry for more. And it's your job and educators' jobs to try to feed that hunger for success. Um, and it can be challenging. So we'll talk about that in, in a couple of slides moving forward. In terms of collaborating with teachers and staff, um, these folks can give you some amazing insights to your child that maybe you didn't realize um, because you're, they're seeing them in a very different setting than you are. Conversely, you'll have some very great input for them to say, hey, did you know that my child really loves this? Or they get very excited about learning about that. Um, one example I'll give you is if your child refuses to listen or, or is unable to listen um, and focus to, let's say, mathematics, but they love the weather or they love race cars, um, the teacher or you can potentially create math problems that center around weather, weather phenomena, tornadoes, windstorms, storm tracking, race cars, lap times. You can get math involved or any subject involved um, and intermix with your child's interests. This is really helpful. Ask about your child's RTI program. So this stands for Response to Intervention. The other uh, acronym is MTSS. Uh, we had a school psych, I think, join us last time, uh, and she reminded me what MTSS stood for. Um, multi-tiered, uh, and I'm gonna forget again, multi-tiered uh, systems of solution, something along there. If she's back today, please, please chime in later. Um, but uh, the traditional um, nomenclature is RTI, so Response to Intervention. Um, and what it is, it's a new take on helping kids in school. So if your child's struggling in school and they're not getting an IEP 
or they don't have an IEP, they don't have um, a 504 plan, uh, but they still need help. Maybe they do need one of those things. Maybe they don't, but no matter what it is, they're struggling in school and they need some help. Ask about RTI. Um, what you can do in RTI is you get a lot of very smart people in the room, yourself, you're the most important one, the parent or guardian. Uh, we get you, we get probably the school psychologist, we get the classroom teacher, maybe a special education teacher. They have a wealth of unique knowledge and experience in coming up with creative solutions. We'll get the school counselor involved, probably an assistant principal or principal. Um, and we bring a bunch of different people together to come up with um, some unique problem solving to say, can we try these one, two, or three things? How do we put them in place? How do we track them to monitor growth? And when can we come back to review progress? So we can look at their response to intervention. Um, this is great because it, it gets things out, it graphs them on a piece of paper or on a screen, and it gives you some data points to understand where's my child starting in terms of their level of challenge or struggle? How are they tracking over time? And what do we have to do next? You know, is this working? They're seeing improvements or it's not working. They're flatlined or making you know, negative progress. But basically it starts the process out to get them some help. Again, so it's not just for students with specialized needs or a learning disability. We have a lot of questions about that. Um, this is for kids who are not performing in school and they're struggling to succeed academically. Um, one thing I will say, you know, if your child has has Bs, you know, they have a B plus, straight B pluses. Um, RTI is probably not for you. This is for kids who are struggling to, to complete, um, you know, their, their, their program. They're, they're struggling to, to attain success. Um, if your definition of success is, you know, we have to have straight A's, your school will probably disagree with that. Um, you know, they're, they're not tasked with optimizing every kid so every kid has straight A's. They're, they're trying to give everybody an equal sh uh, opportunity to be successful, uh, which means that they're, they're passing and they're learning and they're making progress in school. Uh, so there we go. So it's for students struggling with a skill or, or a lesson. So let's talk about therapy. Um, I'm a big proponent of therapies. Um, there's four different types that we can talk about. There's lots more than that out there, but we're gonna focus on four. There's something that I love called CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy. There's a lot of different types of behavioral therapies. And what that means is essentially um, behavioral therapy is um, talking to someone in a way that will shape or modify their behaviors that they're engaging in. Um, so cognitive behavioral therapy is, as the name implies, it's getting them to think about their own thoughts and behaviors. It's getting them to understand how their thoughts, their feelings, um, and their actions can impact their actual behaviors and their, their successes and their failures. Um, it's helping kids to reason through these things. Um, and it's a really neat set of skills they learn because it teaches them how to assess challenges and problems and to understand how they're reacting and responding to them. Um, and it really helps kids, I think, in a lifelong sense, meaning it teaches them how to be good, critical self-thinkers, to be aware of it themselves, their bodies, their thoughts, their feelings, how what they do impacts themselves and other people. Um, so this is a really good, helpful tool for kids to have. Um, sometimes you'll note as a parent that the challenge of just getting your child with ADHD um, to listen and to, to not push back or to refuse um, help, you may feel that no matter what I tell my child, I, I don't know anything. In their mind, I'm a parent. I don't know anything. I don't know how to do basic math. I don't know how to give them reading advice because the way I do it's different than the way the teacher does it. Um, sometimes even if you are a teacher, you'll get the pushback. I push back on my mom. She was a classroom teacher. You don't know how to do this. No, I do. I'm, I'm a teacher. I'm a third grade teacher. My teacher does it different. Sorry. Um, so to get your children to be receptive to get some help, this can even be very helpful. So consider learning more about cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, working with a skilled therapist can teach kids, as I said, coping strategies for ADHD. Um, typically, a question we get a lot is, how long is CBT? What does that look like? I mean, we've seen results for some kids very quickly, depending upon what the challenge is with CBT. But generally speaking, you know, you're looking at six months to 12 months, um, you know, time before you really start to see some, some big changes uh, in the child. So um, it's relatively quick compared to some other types of therapies that, that are out there. There's art therapy. So painting, drawing, sculpting. Um, so it's essentially getting children to think and, and to open up, you know, using the, the modality of, of art. Um, teaches kids to concentrate and express themselves. It can really help some kids um, 
you know, open up in terms of talking about certain things. Same thing for music, um, teaches collaboration, um, and then play therapy, which redirects uncomfortable emotions that could lead to bad behavior. Um, so again, we're not teaching them how to play necessarily. We're teaching them um, to use toys as tools to help, um, you know, reason through things and to teach lessons and help kids to bolster their understanding of situations and things like that. So there's all these different kinds of therapies that are very potentially helpful for you and your child. So learn more about those. Speak to your uh, physician or your psychologist, psychiatrist, etc. Um, so set out a good example. This is just kind of parenting 101. Everyone knows this, but um, kids will, particularly younger ones, will look to you to see how you approach a problem. They'll look to see how you respond to a certain situation. So just be aware of that. It's a, it's a good general tip. There's something called SLANT, um, and we've made an acronym so I would not forget what the acronym was. Um, it's sit up tall, listen to the speaker, ask good questions, nod your head, and talk when appropriate. Um, what the slant technique looks like physically is instead of sitting back in your seat and slumping backwards, um, which starts to give your body signals of, hmm, you know, for me, for Rich, Rich is leaning backwards, his head's back, going to start to trigger some, some sleepy yawning and things like that. And once the yawn kicks in and the rest of my body starts to kind of feel tired, um, your body takes cues from your mind and your mind takes cues from your body. It works very um, uniquely back and forth. So what slant is all about, instead of leaning back and kind of being tired and being in a physical position that's not preparing you for success, it's saying to get up, sit up in your seat, get your shoulders up over your center line of your hips or even lean forward. So lean forward over your hips to make sure that you are in a good listening position. Um, make sure that you're listening to the speaker, you're tracking their mouth with your eyes. So um, if, the, if it's a teacher up there teaching, your child is watching what they're saying, um, and oftentimes we teach in general social skills, make good eye contact with someone. In this case, we would tell them, you know, watch, watch their eyes or even their mouth because it could be really helpful to make sure that you're engaging with what they're saying. Um, get them to nod their head and to give some, some kind of interaction back and forth so it feels less one-sided. It's more of an interactive conversation. Um, and then to ask questions and talk when it's appropriate. We talked about this before, give positive feedback. A, a little bit of a good job you know, great effort today. It goes a long way in helping your child understand the importance in focusing and completing the task on hand. Um, positive feedback can be challenging to give when you have a child with challenging behaviors. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, what I mean by that is a good tip to give positive reinforcement. And as I mentioned, these kids need a little taste of success. You've got to get that big uh, boulder rolling. Picture Indiana Jones. Maybe it was the last crusade. I forget which movie it was, but there's a huge boulder rolling in Indiana Jones. That is how it is to get this process started. There's a great saying, which I love. Um, it's a proverb that goes something to the effect of a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So you have to get this ball rolling. And the first step is usually the hardest. But after that, things tend to progressively increase and improve. So catch them being good is a research-based method of positive behavioral reinforcement you're finding anything to, to compliment your child on. I really love how you took out your book so quickly today. Yesterday, we took a little bit. You were kind of playing with the book and a pencil. Today, you just got right to it, got right to work. Good job. I'm proud of you. It might feel kind of silly to, to give certain praise like that. That's, that's minimally challenging uh, for the general population, if you will. Um, but for these kids, it makes them feel good. Even if they make fun of you, oh, that's silly, mom or dad. Uh, anybody can take out their book. Yeah, but I'm just proud for you because yesterday you, you had a hard time with it and today you nailed it. Keep up the good work. You'll start to see, it's like building a tower out of Legos, which you've done with your child, I imagine, at some point. Um, you just keep stacking them up together and, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and that's how their confidence gets when you can stack things up on top of one another. You can also zen out. Um, help your child avoid a lot of mental fatigue. Um, and you can improve focus. It's actually some really interesting research. I've seen some fMRI, fMRI images showing what kids' brains look like when they are um, practicing yoga. Um, so it helps to relieve stress, can re-energize, increase mindfulness. Uh, for those of you who are old enough to know um, a, a person who I'm a big fan of, Jerry Seinfeld, um, Jerry talked in an interview once about how um, meditation, uh, yoga or meditation, um, 
believe for Jerry, it was transcendental meditation uh, was helping him while he was writing and then acting in the Seinfeld series for so long. He said, it was an amazing way to recharge my brain. I felt like my brain had run out of a battery, uh, but I had never realized it. And when I found meditation, it actually gave me a plug for the charger that's in my brain that I didn't know needed to be recharged. So that's how kids um, can get some help from something like uh, meditation. Again, yoga is also something terrific in terms of a physical um, activity as long as it's done you know, in a safe, supervised fashion. Um, something else I wanna to touch upon is when you're doing home, uh, when you're doing schoolwork at home, you know, you're learning from home. I mentioned this earlier in terms of having a good space to work um, that is free of distractions. I mentioned not leaning back on your seat as if you're falling asleep. Do not encourage kids to work and do their homework in their bed. Um, it's a recipe for distraction, falling asleep, taking a nap during schoolwork. Um, again, your brain learned that when you get in your bed, it's time to go to sleep. That's, that's what your brain starts to learn. When I hop in this bed and I'm, I'm laying on this nice soft you know, bed or this nice soft couch, um, it's comfortable and I'm able to you know, kind of zone out. Um, you want your child to, of course, be comfortable in a comfortable chair, but it should be something where it's not the place that they sleep because their body is going to try to tell them sleep time, sleep time, and something that's already challenging or boring for the child then becomes even more reason to try to fall asleep. So try to nix that if you can. Um, Zen out. So there's some, a couple different ways of what we call here zenning out. So there's deep breathing. Um, you can teach your child and you can get some help from your physician on this um, to breathe deeply. So um, what I like to do personally is um, three to five really big breaths in and I'll hold it for a second and then I'll make sure I slowly and completely exhale. So take big breaths in, big breaths out um, to make sure that it's, it's filling up my lungs and I'm releasing it. Uh, this can really help kids to kind of get to their mental center line, if you will. It'll help them center themselves. Um, calming breaths, again, calm the body and calm the mind. Meditation we just talked about. Sharpens focus and lets thoughts settle. Um, I've seen some people say that they'll actually build in meditation a couple times a day because they'll feel like, I meditate, I charge my battery up, um, but then it runs down in you know, an hour or so. So they'll, they'll meditate a couple times a day. So you can try this for yourself or for your child and see how it works for them. Um, yoga is something else. It's linked to increased self-esteem in kids and just a generally um, neat kind of a fun thing that you can do as long as it's done safely. Um, so if we have any questions, we'd love to take them from you guys here. Uh, it's 1.42. So we've got a little, a little bit of time for, for Q&A. So let me... Um, come back to our screen so I can see what you guys are saying. And uh, let's take it from there. All right, Morgan, do we have any questions from our participants here today? I see a couple hand, hands raised. So I'm just chatting people here to see if they have any questions. Great. One second. Haven't received any chats back yet. No problem. So somebody asked here, when dealing with a child ADHD and ODD, will these techniques work as well? Um, so somebody, somebody asked uh, about ODD and what that stands for um, is Oppositional Defiant Disorder. Um, so there are what we call comorbid conditions when it comes to ADHD, which means um, when you have one thing, it's common to have a couple of other potential things that go along with it. Um, so for ADHD, um, you'll get a couple of common things that will, will sometimes ride alongside ADHD, and it's different for every child. Um, but what that means is it's not uncommon um, for children with ADHD to, to potentially um, you know, be oppositional and defiant, or for them to potentially have trouble with their handwriting, or for them to potentially have trouble uh, with, you know, motor activities in some cases. So these are things that will sometimes um, commonly uh, tie themselves to ADHD. So to the question, um, I think some of those things could potentially be really helpful for kids with ODD, particularly when it comes to, um, to catching them being good. Um, something you can use for kids uh, with, with anything, with ADHD, ODD, um, 
anything really, uh, something that we call a forced choice system. Um, what I like about forced choice systems are it gives the child a sense of control and it de-escalates some of that, um, that power struggle. So instead of saying, you will do your math now, and the child says, no, I will not. Um, you say, you know what? You can pick. Do you want to do math, science, or English language arts first? Totally up to you. But we have a work period. We, we carved out from here to here that we're going to do uh, our work for this time period, and then we'll take a break from here. We'll be consistent with that. But um, it's up to you which subject you want to start with. So that gives a child a sense of control, but it also, in reality, gives you the ultimate control because you're ensuring that one of those three things are going to happen. And we've seen pretty good um, results with that. Something else uh, you can do for children who it becomes a, a, an oppositional or a defiant situation um, is you can, you can have a dramatic impact as the parent um, by the way that you approach things. Um, it's always amazing to parents when we politely challenge someone to say, um, you know, hey, ask yourself how you're talking to your child and how your typical engagement with your child sounds. A lot of times, because we're all human, right, and you cannot beat yourself up over it. You have a really difficult job as a parent of a child with ADHD. This is hard. It's exhausting. It's time consuming. It's expensive. It's emotionally draining. Um, and you're probably doing everything that you can. So do not beat yourself up over this, but this is what happens a lot of times because this is life. You know, after reminding your child for the fifth, 10th, 20th time to do something or to not do something, you start to get frustrated. And then when you get frustrated, they're not gonna go, oh joy, mom or dad is really frustrated at me. They're gonna get frustrated and upset that they're letting you down, which means that they're frustrated. And it creates this negative cycle of interaction. So when you start to yell and to, to, to blast things at your child verbally, and then they start to blast back, it gets very heated very quickly for a lot of parents and children. Um, the best thing you can do is to stop, tell your child, hey, look, I'm a little upset. You're a little upset. Let's take a five minute break. And we're going to talk about this in five minutes when I'm in a good place to talk to you calmly and to say things that I want to say, and you're in a good place to actually hear what I'm saying, you'll be open and receptive to it. Because when we're all keyed up emotionally and our, our blood pressure, you know, our heart's pumping fast and, and we're all amped up on adrenaline, um, it's never a good time to try to, to speak rationally or to help each other out. So a good rule of thumb is if you wouldn't speak to your child with what you're about to say in a negative interaction, you wouldn't say the same thing the same way to one of your ch children's friends who were over for a play date. If you were afraid that their parent would come back to you and say, why did you talk to my child like that? Probably not the best way to, to talk to your child um, when you have a heated interaction like that. So keep that in mind. Um, that's a good strategy, I think. Um, somebody asked how we apply some of these toward teens. Um, something we talk about um, every couple webinars is the challenge of getting teenagers in particular uh, in particular to transition. So they're on a break, let's say it's, they're doing the school from home thing, they're on their Xbox or their PlayStation or their Wii or whatever kids have right now, their Nintendo Switch, um, and they don't want to put it down. Um, how do you overcome that with teenagers? It gets into a kind of this battle and it goes into what I was just talking about. People get hot and heated and adrenaline and yelling and, and bickering. Something that I've shared with people that can be effective, I've heard this from a couple different parents who have done it over the years and I thought it was a really interesting solution, um, is that um, you can basically do what, what my college professor did to me, where I would show up late, minute late, two minutes late, and she said to me, if you're late again, that door is gonna be locked. You're gonna miss what's on our exam next week. Sure enough, I came to class, being the ADHD college kid that I was, showed up late, door was locked. Nope, not going to let you in. Nope, sorry. I told you before, show up on time. I didn't show up till class late again, and there was no argument, there was no interaction, there was no begging, no pleading, it was just a hard, firm no. So um, when a mom asked me a couple weeks ago in a webinar, what can I do to get rid of this you know, bickering that we get between my son and I, who he won't come off the, the PlayStation. Um, my response was, you could try just calmly taking the charger plug, unplugging it, taking it with you and not going to yell, not going to scream, we're not going to debate. And, and it's just, if I have to unplug this thing, it's mine for the rest of the fill in the blank. The, 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 the period, the day, 
you know, the evening, whatever it may be. Um, when you do that two or three times, kids start to quickly learn. When mom says to get off this thing at 1.30, I need to be off this thing at 1.30. She's not gonna play. Um, now you will get, of course, the first time or two, some yelling, screaming, crying on the floor. That's what kids do. Uh, but they should eventually learn that this is how they roll. My, my mom or dad, you know, rolls, they, they drive a tough ship. Um, so I'm gonna follow. Um, what are my thoughts about uh, CBD oil? So I, I don't have any thoughts about CBD oil. I would highly recommend talking to your physician about that. I just don't know enough about it. Um, you know, it's something I've, I've heard a lot about it for humans, for pets. I've seen a lot of stores pop up. I don't have any experience. Um, so uh, I would very strongly recommend that you talk to your physician about anything regarding those kinds of, of interventions, because uh, we just don't know enough about it to give any kind of an opinion. Um, but I, I can, my, my opinion is to be, be very cautious um, and to, uh, to, speak to your physician, speak to your physician and learn more. Um, how do I deal with being impatient and resulting in anger with my ADHD tenure? So that kind of goes back um, to what I mentioned earlier as far as um, oftentimes we as adults or humans get frustrated about things that we care about the most. The more frustrated you get about something, it's likely a good indicator that you really care about it. If it's something you don't care about, um, you know, your neighbor, you know, just got a new car and your spouse takes this really ugly car. Eh, I don't care, whatever, it's not my car, who cares? No big deal. Your child, on the other hand, is something that's incredibly important to you. This is your baby. I don't care if they're, if they're three or they're 13 or they're 23, they're always gonna be your baby. So it's an important thing to you. So you'll typically get more ramped up about your child and their success, particularly when they don't see it. Your child may go, this isn't important, this is stupid. And you're going, oh my God, this is so important. This is your education. I'm trying to help you. You're, you know, the, the, for, the harder I push to help, the harder you push back and the more frustrated I get. So take your time, make sure that you are clearly sharing the thoughts that you want to share. A great um, suggestion that somebody gave me when I was an intern, I was an intern psychologist. They said to me, if you ever get frustrated with anything, um, before you send uh, either an email to somebody or before you go talk to them and you're in a, in a way where you may say something that you'll regret, put it in writing and save it for a few minutes. Um, so this is something that I've found helpful and I've shared with people, um, whether or not you jot it down on your phone in your notes section, um, before you go and actually disseminate that information, um, giving yourself a time to just calm down, you'll be in a better place to say, wow, that was actually kind of mean or rude and nasty um, or, or unhelpful. Um, you may also wind up changing what you were gonna say. So put yourself in a good emotional state. And this is hard and, and you've learned to kind of go boom, 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 back and forth with your child. Um, and there's this feeling that you'll have as a parent of I need to respond now. I'm in charge. I've got to set a good example. I've got to react quickly. I've got to be decisive. Um, in an emergency, that's true. You've got to be decisive, quick on your feet, make a good decision. Um, but typically speaking, arguing with your child about um, doing their work, that's not an emergency situation, right? It can turn into an emergency situation if you keep pushing things upwards. Um, but just take a break, cool out for five minutes, and I can almost guarantee you that when you both go back to talk to each other, you'll be in a much better place. All right, Morgan, were there any more questions um, that I did not see? Yeah, we have just a couple more questions from the chat. Um, someone asked how to get past the it's too hard response um, when that's the immediate response before even starting schoolwork. Good, so good question. Um, that goes back to two things. That goes back to over, um, overestimating the challenge of something, being a child with ADHD, you know, they, they will, think, and myself too, if I'm going to do something, I have some yard work to do. I go, oh, this is going to be horrible. It's taking hours. Once I get out there, I put some stuff in the bag, I rake it up, and I'm all done. I go, yeah, it wasn't so bad. Um, so a couple things. Um, chunk it down into, into more manageable chunks. I don't want you to do 50 problems. We're going to do three problems. Can you do three problems? Do you think you can? Well, yeah, anybody can do three problems. Great. So let's start with that. That's kind of a, a very um, mild CBT light, um, when you challenge someone's thoughts um, using that cognitive behavioral therapy approach. And that's kind of an example of it, um, where I'm gonna use, I'm gonna have somebody question themselves um, and challenge their own thoughts and behaviors um, externally. So I'm gonna pose a question, do you think you can do two problems? So then you can get started. This is, this is not too much, we'll just do two. 
and we'll, we'll look and we'll do two and we'll look and we'll do two and we'll, we'll break it down into little chunks. So that's a really good way to get the, get the party started, if you will. Um, something else that, that you can do um, as well to, to avoid that, that I can't do it mentality um, is, to, is to cite previous history. So you can say things like, do you remember yesterday you actually did 25 problems yesterday. You were on a roll or last week you did all your problems without even me having to help. So you totally can do it. Am I right? Well, I guess I can, but if I, I don't feel like I, I can, but, and then you can just start to basically refute their um, fears or their belief with facts and with, with truths to, to help center and ground them as far as, you know, where their emotions are. Um, someone asked about, uh, does we have a way I can program different topics in different modes? Yeah. Yes. Um, so we actually just, um, and we, we try to not, you know, talk about things that, that, that we, um, sell as a company, but you know, these are designed to help you guys, but if you have a question, I'm happy to answer it. So, um, yes, we actually just today finished, um, what should be the last leg, uh, of our testing. So in the next couple days to to week or two, hopefully not more than three weeks, um, depending how long it takes Apple to introduce um, the mode. Um, we, we have actually pushed it. It's available right now in on Android. Um, you can actually schedule your revive to go into homework mode during certain times um, automatically, and then it'll go back to adaptive mode um, by itself. So you don't have to manually change it and resync, change it and resync. So that's live right now for Android and, and the Apple um, update should be live within, I would say, um, one week to three weeks, depending upon how long it takes Apple to get it in there. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, I will tell you, um, make sure you have it set as its own time chunk. Don't try to put it um, on top of it or it won't, it won't allow that. So um, just make your own section right there for work time. Great question. Um, any more questions as we wind out? I see most of our guests are still here with us. We've got a, about four or five minutes left. Is any final questions or thoughts or even suggestions for us as far as what would you guys like to hear? What would be helpful for you to learn from a webinar? Um, we've done an Ask um, Psychologist Anything. We've done uh, sessions for kids. So give us your thoughts. Yeah. Um, uh, well, first, I just wanted to answer a bunch of people were asking if they'll get a copy of the recording. Um, yes, absolutely. We'll be emailing that to you by tomorrow afternoon, and it'll be available on YouTube as well on our channel. Um, and then back to you, Rich, with just a couple more questions that I'm seeing. Um, someone actually asked, how can we test our child for IEP and a learning disability given the shelter in place? When would, when would that typically take place? So that's a really interesting question. Um, a lot of things are now going virtual. Um, so there's two ways generally you can get your child tested um, to see if they may qualify for an IEP. Um, the way to start, if you've started with nothing, generally is to go through the RTI process I mentioned. They'll have to um, cite data points before they can provide an IEP for someone. So they'll have to say, this child, uh, we have data to show this child did or did not respond to interventions. Um, and if they did not respond, then they may be eligible, if they're eligible for a couple of other things, um, they may be eligible for an IEP, meaning special education services. Excuse me. Um, so there's, there's two ways that happens. Um, either the school will provide this. It typically takes um, several weeks to get um, the data that you need. And if you are a Revive user, you may have some of that data already. Just go to your school report, tap uh, school report, and it'll automatically pull the last six weeks of data and present it in a report PDF format that you can bring to school. So you can shorten your time potentially like that to, to garner data. But generally speaking, it takes um, you know a week or two, a couple of weeks to get on the uh, RTI team schedule or calendar. Um, then it will take you know four to six weeks of intervention to try some things out, see how they're doing. Um, and then from, from that point, um, you know, you'll circle back and then most schools, every, every state's different. Here in North Carolina, um, from the, the day that the paperwork is signed uh, uh, or, or I believe recommended um, for uh, NIEP uh, until the day that you close out and make your placement decision, um, you've got 90 days for that process um, from start to finish. So that's a, you know, four month plus process right there. 
um, that's what most people, that's the path most people go down because it's the most um, available, it's the most cost effective. Um, there are a lot of people who, who will use a private evaluator. So you can use a private psychologist to do the psychoeducational testing. This does not, however, get you around that six week time span I mentioned earlier. You still have to show a response or lack of response to intervention um, to get those services. But you can, you can knock down theoretically 60 to 90 days worth of testing time and evaluation and report time um, if you do have a private evaluator do it. Now to answer your question about shelter in place, I'm honestly not sure what people are doing right now uh, for psychoeducational evaluations. Um, what that means is, in case you're not familiar with what psychoeducational evaluation is, it sounds like some kind of a weird thing. Um, it's just a psychological and educational, psychoeducational evaluation. So it's typically an IQ test, uh, an educational test. Um, so the IQ test will look for where are your cognitive strengths, um, where are your, your areas of need, um, you know, where, where should we expect this child to be performing in terms of their ability level. Um, and then when you look at the educational side, that's essentially um, what are their skills in whatever areas of concern there may be, uh, reading, writing, math, et cetera. Um, and then for learning disabilities, uh, you typically look in the old fashioned model to see a discrepancy. Is there a discrepancy of a certain amount between the IQ and how they're actually performing? Um, or is there a lack of response to the intervention? Um, every school system around the country does it a little bit differently right now, but that's how it works. I'm not sure if people are doing any kind of virtual cognitive assessment. That's a great question. I'm actually going to pose that to um, our strategic partner, Multi Health Systems, uh, who creates some of the best assessments um, for children, uh, for school systems, and, and clinicians to use. Um, so it's a great question. I'll, I'll find out about that. I'm, I'm not sure, but um, but generally speaking. Um, I would start collecting data. You can collect data at home. You can start to put interventions in place, whether it's the revive intervention and you're tracking the revive data um, or you're putting your own interventions in place, but start to get that data. Um, I would assume even if it's from home, uh, on IP teams that I've served on, um, we have accepted um, you know, good data that was consistently taken by parents, even in the home setting. So that's a good way to start. Um, someone asked about no after school activities to engage my son. Um, the number. On the no, the number of after school activities, um, three or four, but he ends up struggling pretty much everything. So, um, I'm I, my personal. This is a very personal thing, and I'm sure it's unique for every child. But um, I'm more of a fan uh, of quality over quantity. Um, I would rather see my child, you know, if I were a parent in your shoes. Um, engage in, you know, one sport that really allowed them to get, you know, some energy, some exercise um, from that aspect, but also almost more importantly, give them an outlet um, to feel success and to feel um, pride in doing something. So if they're going to do four sports and falter in all of them because they're constantly being shuffled from practice to practice to practice and they're exhausted and they don't know if they're playing baseball or soccer or football today, um, I would rather personally see them, you know, have one sport where they're doing really well and they feel good about themselves. Um, and, I, and I would probably supplement, um, if you were doing four sports and now you're doing one sport, I would supplement, you know, extra exercise and focus on like, you know, running or exercising to bolster that one sport that you're trying to focus on. Um, but that, that is something that, I mean, even myself as an ADHD adult, um, I love to do lots of different things. I know I love to, you know, run, hike, camp, bike, do, I like to do it all. So that's, that's the challenge is picking one thing um, or picking at least a good balance that works for your child. Um, would you consider having a webinar for teens, getting homework done, focusing, no pushing back? Yes, we actually did this um, and, and we're happy to do it again. Uh, we had a mom who wrote us a really nice email after we did this. It was, it was more uh, geared for just children in general, um, you know, children and teens. Uh, but it was basically explaining, you know, what's going on, how does focus and ADHD work, how do these things interact together. Um, and a mom wrote us a really nice email and said, hey, um, you know, I've been trying to tell my son for like years um, that this is not, a, a, you know, a, con a condition that's going to necessarily inhibit you from being successful. And you're not the only kid who's facing this. But he would always say to me, you're wrong. You don't know. You're just saying that because you're my mom. But she emailed us and said, for the first time hearing somebody else talk about it and some of the kids asking questions allowed him to feel 
you know, part of something and, and to feel not different from anybody else. Um, and we try to highlight when we do these things, um, you know, that you're actually can be, it can be a challenge to do some things, but you have a superpower for some of the other things. You have a hyper focus power where maybe the harder things are challenging to focus on, but the things you're interested in, you can zoom in with it like a laser beam and really hyper focus for way longer than anybody else. So how to harness that superpower. So we'd love to do that. Um, Morgan and I will talk offline about that. We can do uh, a webinar focusing on teens uh, harnessing their superpower. So that's, that's a great idea. Um, someone else here, uh, strategies do we recommend for households with multiple ADHD and ADHD children and adults who are trying to be successful during COVID? Routine, routine, routine. Um, and this is hard, um, particularly when you are a parent um, with ADHD trying to help others in your household who also have ADHD. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really challenging. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, it's challenging enough to just parent a child, one child with ADHD, let alone be a parent managing a household full of people like me or like you who are, are struggling with a couple different things um, when it comes to focus and attention. So my suggestion to you is um, get a notebook and just live by this planner or calendar. You know, you see some people who live by their, their planner. You have to make it a point to be consistent. And this is hard. This is not easy. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. My own exercising routines, even for myself, um, you know, I try to be very consistent. I'm not great about it. Um, I'm consistent enough that I'm doing it every week, but I don't wake up at the exact same time like I want to and do it the exact same way. Um, so it's a challenge, but the best thing you can do is follow your own rules. Get a notebook, put it down, set alarms in your phone, Calendar reminders are a great tool for you as a parent to remember to do something. And the most important thing you can do as an adult uh, struggling with ADHD is to say, no matter what I'm doing right now, um, I know that I'm going to roll into the next thing. Uh, this is supposed to start now, but I'm working on this. It's really important. You have to say, I'm sorry to yourself. I'm sorry. I have to close this chapter. It's time to stay on track. Go to the next thing really critical, but also really difficult. Um, awesome, let's see any other questions. I'm curious if anybody here, um, you know, is, is open to sharing, you know, not about yourself, but if anybody's open to sharing here, um, how many of our parents and guardians here, you know, have at least one adult in the house with ADHD? I'm always curious about that. Um, but in the meantime, uh, how can we help with impulsivity? Um, impulsivity, we have something that uh, myself and our, our friend, Dr. Poole over at Fast Brain, um, we call pumping our brakes. Uh, I learned actually one of our, our new scientific advisory board members um, is a gentleman named Dr. Cecil Reynolds, uh, who's a world renowned uh, test developer, test author. Um, and he let me know, uh, you know, hey, I, I actually coined that phrase in a book I wrote back in the 80s. Um, you know, slow down, pump the brakes a little bit in this Ferrari that you're driving that is the ADHD brain. So impulsivity um, can occur um, with the best intentions. Kids, oh, I know, let me do it. I'm afraid if I don't do it right now, I'm going to forget. Um, so the best thing you can do is to get, again, get a little notebook for kids. There's something magical about a pencil and paper. Um, whether you're trying to remember things, we've seen research that shows um, writing things on paper can help encode into memory better than just like saying them out loud for some people. So get them a pencil and paper and say, if you want to do something, um, let's say you want to blurt out, write your thought down on this piece of paper, save it, and then give it to me when it's time. Um, if they're going to do something impulsive, like they're going to poke their brother or sister, or they're going to knock their food off the table, tell them, and this is a learning thing, it's going to happen over time. Before you do something, slow down and ask yourself, good idea, bad idea. So red light or green light or, or yellow light? How does it look in your head? Um, with enough practice, sometimes after the fact, Boom, I just did this. What could you have done? What should you have done? I should have asked myself before I did it. With enough kind of backwards working, I've found that it does help kids when they've heard it, they hear it enough times, um, they will start to kind of, before they do something, think about it. And this takes a while, but I, I believe it is something that you can help kids to learn um, to be better at, right? This, all this happens because of, of some chemicals in the brain that are, are you know, either um, high or low, et cetera. Um, so, you can't necessarily, you know, fix that um, or change that. 
magically by just thinking something and, and doing it, but you can put yourself in a better position to be more successful. They may always have the impulse, but at least they won't act on it now, right? So you can't change maybe the impulse of coming to the, the child's brain because of the you know, etiology of the impulse, but you can certainly put them in a position to not act on it, if that makes sense. Um, next question, how do kids with ADHD succeed in college without a treatment? Um, it's interesting. A lot of the adults, um, our adult users that we talked to shared, you know, hey, I wish I had some, you know, I had this technology when I was in college, or I wish I had um, these interventions or these, these strategies in place when I was in college. A lot of them do learn to be successful. However, um, and this is not a scare tactic, but this is a, a, an a inform yourself tactic. Um, and, and don't hold me to it because I'm going to forget the exact number, but I want to say, um, you know, over 30% of these children, I believe of, with children with ADHD, um, either combined type or primarily an attentive type, I forget the subtype, but uh, there was a substantial percentage of these kids who wind up not going to college or, or dropping out of college. Um, also, we see similar-ish numbers when it comes to struggling in the workplace. Um, again, don't hold me to that number because I'm just shooting from the hip, um, but that there is research that shows um, that if gone completely um, unassisted in any way, these kids are, are at a higher risk for academic um, failure, at a higher risk for um, you know, employment termination, things like that. So that's important to give them some of these tools. Um, the people who I've spoken to who are successful, and lots and lots and lots of people, um, myself, I went through through high school, college, grad school without knowing that I really had a focusing problem without realizing it. Um, my sibling was diagnosed with ADHD and I wasn't. Um, I think I'm primarily an attentive type. So I just learned coping mechanisms. I had to work a lot harder than everybody else, I think, um, you know, to, to, to just do as, you know, even or equal to them. Um, I had to work harder. So it's certainly doable. I've seen tons of kids I've worked with over the years go through college and be very successful. Um, but I do recommend, you know, getting some strategies in place to help your child be more prepared for that, for sure. Um, what if the impulsivity is very aggressive towards older kids? Um, in, that's something where, you know, I would try to explore the root of that challenge. Um, you know, talk to your physician or therapist, uh, psychologist, you know, maybe there's, um, you know, some, some thought or some reasons around that. Um, one more question here. Uh, how do you encourage your ADHD teen to take their medication on a regular basis? forcing them. So um, there's a good book you can read. I, I don't have an answer for that because I'm, again, I'm, I'm not a physician. I'm not a pediatrician. Um, so I'm, I'm not the best person to give advice uh, on meds or, or taking meds. Um, but generally, I'll, I'll give two responses. The first response is not medication specific, but um, just in a generality um, to get your child to get on board with doing things that are helpful for them to improve their focus is to let them know that A, you know, we're here, you know, you as the parent or guardian, the child, physician, teacher, whoever, um, we're all here for the same reason, is to see that you are successful. We don't want you to have to have this huge uphill battle that life can sometimes feel like. Um, so the goal of whatever it is, um, the intervention, medication, whatever, you know, it may be that you're talking about, um, whatever your goal is, you know, our goal is, is a good one. Our, our, our intentions are good. We're trying to help you and put you in a place of success to make your life easier and better. So let's talk about what those options look like. A lot of kids, when they hear it framed that way, that, you know, they're not being pushed from behind like a, like a horse, you know, over a stream, but they're more like they're the ones in the wagon and you are, and the teacher and et cetera, are the horses that are pulling them through this. They tend to take a different perspective, um, than, you know, just having it kind of crammed, uh, you know, when they don't want it. Uh, okay, um, so due to economic climate, can we offer any discounts? So um, that, that's a great question. Um, send us a note. We're happy to support people um, as best we can. We're a small company, um, but we're happy to try to support people. We want to make sure that we're getting help uh, on the risk of those who need it. So if you um, have any questions about pricing or, um, you know, special deals. We're happy to try to work with people. Just send us, uh, you know, a, a note um, if you're being economically impacted and we'll, we'll do whatever we can um, to make sure that we're supporting you. You can send it to info, I-N-F-O at revibetech.com or support, S-U-P-P-O-R-T at revibetech.com. Awesome. I think, I think that was uh, 
all the questions, Morgan, unless I missed any. All right, so thank you guys so much for all your yep. questions. We're, we're thrilled to have you guys, and we, we will set up um, a webinar for teens with ADHD. I love that suggestion. Um, anything else you guys think of, please reach out to us and let us know. We, we love our customers. We're very customer-centric. Um, we learn as much from you as we hope you learn from us. So stay well, stay healthy. And remember, as I said, you know, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, and it starts with you, the parent or guardian. Hang in there. You've got a tough fight, but I know you can be successful, and your child can too. Thank you very much.